If you paid any attention to the first Guardians of the Galaxy or to the subsequent frustrating quest to uncover his super-secret hidden easter egg, you should already know that James Gunn is the master of easter eggs, background references, and in-jokes in the MCU. He shoved loads of the blighters into Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 2, perhaps even more than we were able to spot. But for now, I'm Ben from What Culture, and here are 35 Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 2 easter eggs and references you must see. Number 35. Missouri It's hardly a major egg, but James Gunn has clearly changed the location of Peter Quill's birthplace to Missouri as a nod to his own upbringing there. In the comics, Peter was actually born in Colorado. Number 34. Meredith Quill Returns The very opening of the film sees the return of Laura Haddock's Meredith Quill, who appeared at the start of the first film in the ever-so-slightly emotionally devastating death scene. Here, she appears vital and in love with a young Kurt Russell's ego, telling the story of their romance and Peter's conception. Also, this is a good time to remind you that Haddock actually appeared in the MCU before Guardians of the Galaxy. She was the girl looking for Cap's autograph in the first Captain America movie, presumably putting her in her 60s or 70s? Looks good for her age. Number 33. Star-Lord's Football Game The film opens with the Guardians waiting around for the obelisk to appear through its wormhole to steal some of the Sovereign's Anulax batteries, named, incidentally, after a brand of medical anal probe. There's a little extra easter egg for you. As we see Star-Lord tracking its location using his delightfully naff calculator-looking device, it should actually be familiar to some 80s kids, as it's a Mattel Electronics classic football game, but it appears he might have retooled it for its new usage. Number 32. The Dancing Groot Drax Coolback During the incredible opening sequence that sees the obelisk attacking and Baby Groot stealing all the focus by dancing around to ELO's Mr. Blue Sky, he interacts with the various Guardians as they're tossed around by the giant sharktopus alien thing creature. Arguably the best interaction comes when Drax crash lands and Groot freezes while he's looking at him, only moving again when he glances away. It's a nice little redo of the in-credit scene from the first film when Dancing Groot was in his pot. Presumably, dancing still infuriates Drax. Number 31. Peter Quill's T-Shirt The mystery of Peter Quill's T-Shirt slogan has been picked at ever since it debuted in the first trailer, and wouldn't you know it, it actually means something in an alien language. Luckily, some nerds put the time in to translate it using the reference of alien language Klin, developed for the first Guardians of the Galaxy, and Reddit solved the first part as reading Gears Shift. The other parts of the slogan read Dust, Cement, Stone, Ash, which is even more confusing, but underneath, the main line reads A Tenike Galaxy Invention, which referenced Karen Tenike, the graphic designer and frequent MCU collaborator who worked on the film. The most complicated crew nod ever! Number 30. The Gallagher Reference Aisha's drone army includes quite a big nod to arcade gaming history in their design. There's one point in the sequence where the drones swarm in two lines, aping the recognizable movement of classic arcade game Gallagher's enemy ships. And if you listen closely, you'll even hear some classic arcade sounds too. This isn't the first time we've seen a Gallagher reference in the MCU either, as Tony Stark referred to the game in the Avengers Assemble on the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier bridge. Number 29. Bahurt after the Sovereign attack is thwarted by Ego, he follows the Guardians to the surface of Behurt, where the Milano is incapacitated. I hope I pronounced Behurt right, I have no idea. The planet's name should be familiar to Marvel fans, as it's appeared in the comics before as the home of the Sagittarians, Princess Daedra and Warlord Supreme. Number 28. The Trash Panda Meme Clearly, James Gunn is a fan of Reddit. Back in 2014, Redditor Carl Peligro rebranded Raccoons Forever by commenting on a photo of a raccoon with the immortal line, Raccoons equal trash pandas. Thanks to him, Reddit, Imgur, and Instagram users have appropriated the new name for the animals, including an entire subreddit dedicated to them. And now, it's officially part of the MCU, too. Number 27. Stallone's Cameo Despite the many rumors as to who he was set to play, Sylvester Stallone turns up quite early in the film playing Ravager Stakar, better known in the comics as Starhawk, a hero who is part of one iteration of the Guardians of the Galaxy team. That explains why the sequel's working title was Guardians 3000, as he was, of course, the founder of the Guardians of the Galaxy in the 31st century and appeared alongside Major Victory, Yondu, Martin X, and Charlie 27 in that lineup. Number 26. Contraxia. The snowy world that features the space brothel and its sexy robots is introduced as Contraxia, which is another obscure location from the comics. It is a dying planet whose sun has shut down and was the home planet of the mother of Marvel hero Jack of Hearts. 
Contraxians are a humanoid race similar to humans as their planet is the third in its system, with pink or brown skin who look like humans apart from one half of their bodies being darker. Number 25. Martin X. The crystal-skinned lieutenant to Stallone's Stakar, who stands at his side on Contraxia, is also a member of the original Guardians of the Galaxy team. Known as Martin X, he was born on Pluto and was described by writer Dan Abnett as the brain of the team. He's made of crystal as his species was genetically engineered to withstand the extreme cold conditions on Pluto, and he's played by an almost completely unrecognizable Michael Rosenbaum. Smallville's Lex Luthor, who is a friend of director James Gunn. Number 24. Howard the Duck Returns Another eye-catching character who appears on Contraxia is none other than Howard the Duck, who probably headed straight to the Pleasure Planet after he was freed from the Collector's prison cell at the end of Guardians of the Galaxy. Gunn seems to have a soft spot for the character, which explains why he's been in both of his Guardians films now, and while it's nice to see him again, it's probably best he doesn't get his own film just yet. He also reappears during the Easter egg-stuffed final credits sequence. Number 23. Knight Rider when Star-Lord is aware of Ego's status as his real father, he shares a touching moment with Gamora as she repeats her favorite story about his childhood. He used to tell his friends that his real father was David Hasselhoff, who Gamora accidentally calls Zardu Hasselfrau, and that he has a talking car that went on adventures. That's obviously a callback to Knight Rider, which stars Hasselhoff as Michael Knight. It's a further 80s nostalgic reference in a movie that clearly loves the decade but is fully aware of how silly it was. Number 22. Ego Self-Awareness when Ego was revealed to be Peter's dad online well before the film was revealed, the question of how exactly a huge planet and a lady could have sex was very quickly raised as a humorous criticism of the creative decision to make him the father. And that cynicism is reflected perfectly in the film, as an in-joke when Drax asks Ego if he has a penis. He does, and it's a damn fine one, and excuses his question by saying he needs to know how he would have been able to have sex with a human without smushing her. There you go. Number 21. The Cheers Gag there's a very Rachel Ross dynamic about Gamora and Peter Quill's relationship throughout Guardians Volume 2, without much real resolution, and at one point Star-Lord offers a meta-reference point for their relationship. He says the pair enjoy an unspoken romantic connection just like in a TV show, where there's this unspoken thing that the writers extend without resolution in case the ratings drop. He specifically mentions Cheers, which had two of those relationships, the first one between Diane and Sam ending to pick ratings up. Number 20. North by Northwest As soon as Nebula and Gamora are reunited, it's inevitable that they're going to throw down at some point during Volume 2, and James Gunn obliged with an all-action set piece that saw the Blue Sister basically trying to drop a spaceship on her sibling. That sequence, which is framed around the idea that Thanos played them both off against one another, feels a hell of a lot like a North by Northwest homage as Gamora dodges bullets running across the open ground. Number 19. Peter's gonna build some weird sh**. When Ego reveals that Star-Lord has more powers than he's aware of and explains exactly how he was able to hold an Infinity Stone in his bare hands in the first outing, he teaches him about the limits of their projection powers. Peter being Peter, his immediate response is to go straight back to several 80s reference points. His powerful manifesto would see him using his powers to create Pac-Man, Skeletor, and Heather Locklear. There's also a moment in that exchange that sees Ego literally fill Star-Lord's eyes with stars to show him the limits of the galaxy. Quill's response is to whisper eternity in awe, which definitely feels like a nod to the all-powerful personification of the Marvel Universe, whose look probably inspired the change in Peter's eyes. Number 18. Stan Lee's cameos explained, and The Watchers. Stan Lee's cameo in Volume 2 is one of the best in the entirety of Marvel's catalogue, and basically seems to confirm a long-standing fan theory about how he turns up in every film. Here, he appears briefly on a distant moon discussing the time he was a delivery man, confirming that he is indeed the same character seen throughout the MCU and not multiple alternate stands. More interestingly, the aliens he's talking to are clearly the Watchers, the super-powerful race who literally watch over the Marvel Universe without interfering, although they hardly ever stick to that. In the same 700 Space Leap sequence that we see them in, we also get a brief shot of a pair of fighting Cronans, the same race as Korg, who Taika Waititi is playing in Thor Ragnarok. Number 17. Hasselhoff's Cameo when Ego reveals that he's actually a maniacal space zealot with an intention to destroy the galaxy and redesign it in his image, he makes the mistake of telling Peter that he killed his mother over fears his love for her would cause him to abandon his plot. Weirdly, that's enough to turn Peter against his father, and when he shoots him, Ego angrily challenges him, saying he tried to be everything he wanted as a father. At that point, Kurt Russell transforms into Star-Lord's icon David Hasselhoff to sell the point even more. 
In terms of other actor cameos, there's also a Ravager appearance from Sons of Anarchy actor Tommy Flanagan and a cameo by Farscape actor Ben Browder as a Sovereign Admiral. Number 16. Ego's Final Form Though we were all led to believe that we wouldn't get to see Ego in his planetary form, we do actually glimpse the Celestial as a planet with a face, thankfully. It doesn't talk, that would be horrifying. And as another reference to the comics, his attempt to take over the galaxy with his rather clunkily named Expansion Mission is clearly a redo of The Stranger's plan to destroy Ego in the comics by assimilating him into a larger bioverse called Super Ego. Number 15. Mary Poppins and the Smurfs as Quill and Yondu descend to the inner surface of Ego after their ship blows up, Peter remarks that Yondu looks like Mary Poppins, to which Yondu asks if he's a cool guy before crowing, I'm Mary Poppins, y'all. Also, of all the daft criticisms and pet names used in the film, Star-Lord calling Nebula Smurfette is one of the standouts, and it's a nice callback to the fact that Peter is stuck in a past that nobody else has any awareness of, reinforcing the fact that he really is a man out of time. There's also another slightly weird reference, which could well be unintentional, but when Mantis says that Baby Groot is so cute that she's going to die, it very much feels like a reference to that despicable me scene involving a stuffed unicorn. Number 14. Peter's Grandfather when Ego turns on his seedling pods on the planets he's marked out to take over, the one he left in Missouri starts to envelop some of Peter Quill's hometown streets, and it narrowly avoids crushing a car. If you look closely, you'll see that the car is actually carrying Peter Quill's grandfather, played by Greg Henry. And in the same scene, we briefly see an old couple asking what the hell the giant blob that was just eating the planet is, and they are Jim Gunn Sr. and Leota Gunn, the parents of James Gunn. Number 13. Star-Lord's Higher Form when Peter channels his powers for the final time to take on Ego, he delivers on his earlier promise that he's going to make a giant Pac-Man by literally cladding his body in rocks to wear a Pac-Man-shaped outer armor, complete with the iconic sound effects. Incidentally, Star-Lord being a Celestial isn't just plucked out of the air and has some foundation in the comics, as he's the grandson of Essen the Searcher. Recognize that name? You should. It belongs to the guy from the Collector's History of the Infinity Stones in Guardians of the Galaxy. The one what killed that planet with the, with the purple stone. You remember? There he is. Number 12. The Troll After Yondu sacrifices himself to save Peter Quill, having revealed he felt he was his real father all along, we get the gut-wrenching funeral scene that should leave everyone in bits. As the Guardians prepare to cremate him in the Milano's engine, Yondu's body is surrounded by trinkets and tributes to him, and one is the troll Peter places next to him, which was, of course, also the item he swapped for the Power Stone in the first film's climax. Number 11. The Zoon Gag the question of how the third film would deal with music once the second awesome mix was finished with has been a puzzling one. The answer comes in Volume 2 in a joke aimed at Microsoft, claiming that everyone on Earth has a Zune in 2014. Quill's excitement says everything about why this is important for the future of the Guardians franchise. Plus, it means we'll get songs from between 1984 and 2014 rather than just nostalgic tracks. Number 10. Rob Zombie's Cameo there are a couple of unseen cameos in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Nathan Fillion was cut despite being cast as walking Easter egg Simon Williams, aka Wonder Man, and Rob Zombie returned after voicing a computer in the first film to play a character officially billed as Unseen Ravager. Number 9. Cosmo the Wonder Dog the credits are positively packed with easter eggs and gags, and one of the first is the reappearance of Cosmo the Wonder Dog, who appeared in the first film as part of the collector's vault of space goodies and escaped with Howard the Duck. The dog is seen in a moving portrait right at the start of the credits, despite rumors that he was actually going to be a part of the film itself. Number 8. The Credits Groot Gags Throughout the credits, several of the credited crew and actors have had their names replaced with I am Groot before transforming as they scroll up the screen. There's also a rather charming gag in place of the usual No Animals Were Harmed blurb, reading No Raccoons or Tree Creatures Were Harmed in the Making of This Movie. However, the same cannot be said of their handlers. Number 7. Hasselhoff Again As revealed when the tracklist for Awesome Mix Volume 2 was released, David Hasselhoff actually has a musical billing in the film too, rapping over the nostalgic Guardians Inferno recorded by the Sneepers, who don't actually seem to be a real band. And as if that isn't enough, the end of the credits sees Hasselhoff himself appear again in a portrait bubble to offer the final, inspirational message, we are all Groot. Number 6. The Grandmaster's Cameo there are also a couple of references to Thor Ragnarok hidden in Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 2's easter eggs. The first is the appearance of the Cronans, and the second comes at the end credits. The credits see all the Guardians characters dancing along to the Sneaper's final track in little, moving portraits, and as a nice, surprising cool forward to Ragnarok, Jeff Goldblum's The Grandmaster also appears, dancing too in full costume. 
Number five. Post credits number one. Kraglin learns the Yaka Arrow. The first mid credit sequence happens immediately after the climax, even before any actual credits really roll. In it, we see Kraglin, pretty much the only survivor of Yondu's Ravager faction and seemingly now a fully-fledged guardian, since he refers to Star-Lord as Captain, attempting to master Yondu's repaired Yaka Arrow that Star-Lord passes on to him after his friend's death. Unfortunately, it turns out it's hard to master immediately as he accidentally stabs Drax with it and runs away. Number 4. Post credits number 2. The Reformed Guardians 3000 and Kruger. The second mid-credits reveals Michelle Yeoh and Ving Rhames in a meeting with Stallone's Stakar, Michael Rosenbaum's Martinex, and red, magic-wielding alien Kruger. There's also a vocal cameo by Miley Cyrus as mainframe which reveals the team to be the original Guardians 3000 members. Kruger himself is from an alternate future and is a member of a snake-like race who becomes Doctor Strange's apprentice in the comics before succeeding him as the Sorcerer Supreme. Number 3. Post-credits number 3. Adam Warlock. In Aisha's mid credit sequence, it's revealed that the Sovereign Council are annoyed at her for wasting resources attempting to get revenge on the Guardians. She's obviously dejected, but she has a plan, revealing that she's created her own genetically pure, powerful Superman to take on the Guardians, who she calls Adam. For the uninitiated, that's confirmation of Adam Warlock. Number 2. Post Credits Number 4. Teenage Groot. The best mid credit scene is the second last one, which confirms that Groot is growing, so we should see him back to his full-sized iteration by the time the Guardians mash up with the Avengers for Infinity War. The scene sees Peter Quill going into Groot's messy bedroom to admonish him for not pulling his weight around the ship and to complain about his vines being all over the place. Groot is now a surly teenager, playing video games and generally not looking after himself. Number 1. Post Credits Number 5. Stan Lee's Stranded. The final post credit scene returns us to the distant, barren planet that Stan Lee is on, talking to the Watchers, who leave him stranded, much to his annoyance. The idea that Lee is actually one character travelling through all of the movies fits in with the fan theory that he might actually be one of the Watchers himself, popping up as an observer. Could he be Uatu, Earth's designated Watcher? Or might he actually be the One Above All, who created all of the Marvel Universe's existence? But if that was the case, he presumably wouldn't be so bothered about being stranded. And that's our list! Make sure you subscribe to the What Culture YouTube channel for more lists like this, and don't forget to visit whatculture.com for daily news and articles. I'm Ben from What Culture. You can follow me here on Twitter. Please do it. There it is. Go and follow me. And thanks for watching.